Happy Tuesday, football fans, and welcome into another edition of the Pro Football Chase Podcast. I'm Isaac Sines, and I thank you for joining me. In today's episode, NFL defensive tackle Jarrell Worthy and I recap Week 11 and discuss trending topics including Colin Kaepernick's battle with the NFL, the Texans' playoff chances, and the fallout from last Thursday's brawl between the Browns and Steelers. We also discuss and predict Week 12's matchups. This is the Pro Football Chase Podcast, a podcast that has featured interviews with Rams wide receiver Robert Woods. 300,000 yards, uh, and you know, last year, unfortunately, I got hurt mid mid way in the season, but other than that, just just working and grinding to, to get to this point, and uh, probably broke it with a lot of games left. Packers wide receiver Marquez Valdez Scantling. Uh, just the fact that we got a, you know, uh, all pro on the other side of the ball. Um, and Devontae. Um, so when you got a guy like that, you know, that's who's going to get the main focus. Um, obviously, you know, people start to know my name a little bit after I made a few plays here and there. Broncos offensive guard Ronald Leary. It would either have to be a counter or a pin and pull play when we get on the edge and run. Um, I think it's always impressive when big guys can get out that stance and move and hit somebody. So. And rising stars Dalton Risner, Charles Amenahu, and Jawan Williams. This is a podcast that offers player perspectives from some well-decorated veterans, including T.J. Hushman Zada. And people will say, oh, well, is that Chris got a franchise quarterback? Uh, look, look at his record, does it? It tells you he is. Oh, he has a great defense. He has his D.J. Carelli. You tell me a quarterback in the entire NFL that's not time break that does more with that. Game previews, recaps, and analysis. Turn the volume up. The chase is on, and the chase is live. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome into the Pro Football Chase Podcast. It's Isaac Signs with you, along with my co-host, NFL defense tackle, Jarrell Worthy. We are recording a day earlier than we typically do. I'll be uploading it today on a Tuesday, considering some travel arrangements, but looking forward to getting into a lot of different topics. So, Jarrell, how are you doing today, man? Man, I am doing phenomenal today. It's a great Tuesday. Uh, Taco Tuesday. (laughs) (laughs) Nah, man. (laughs) Nah, I'm just enjoying my day, man. It's a beautiful day uh, once again down here in Georgia, man, and we continue to keep uh, making moves. Man, I cannot believe we're already entering week 12 of the NFL season. It's kind of bittersweet because it's exciting because we know the playoffs are rapidly approaching, but it's also kind of sad because the season just seems to be flying by as week 11 was concluded last night with the Chiefs and Chargers. Of course, the Chiefs taking the victory 24-17, but we're going to go ahead and get into our offensive player of week 11. So Jarrell, why don't you go ahead and get us started in that category? Yeah, so it was a lot of, it was a lot of, uh, a, a lot of big games as far as, um, you know, the offensive side of the ball when, you know, I mean, for me personally, I know you would love to see me give it to Dak Prescott. I know this. Now that's I know right. Love, that's I know right. you would love to see me give it to Dak Prescott. But I'm going to go uh, another NFC quarterback um, at the NFC North. I'm going to go with Kirk Cousins um, for his comeback victory, man. Uh, one of the biggest comeback uh, victories um, for the Minnesota Vikings, um, a guy that's been going through a lot of ups and downs. Uh, this season as far as, uh, you know, the criticism on his play. And uh, for him to go 29 of 35, 319 yards, three touchdowns, and a, and a comeback victory, uh, erasing a 20-point t- deficit at the half. Um, when you're playing anybody in the NFL, man, it's very tough to win games, let alone come back from behind um, after being down 20, 20 points. And I think it's, it's, a, uh, it's just a testament to the Minnesota Vikings it's a testament to Kirk Cousins, and uh, I think he's my Offensive Player of the Week. You already know who my Offensive Player of Week 11. You just mentioned him. Dak Prescott threw for 444 yards, 29 of 46 passing, had touchdown passes to Randall Cobb, Tony Pollard, and Ezekiel Elliott in the Cowboys' 35-27 win against the Lions. Now, the Lions, they've struggled defensively, and so 
A lot of people will discredit Prescott and his performance, but Dak Prescott has had a really incredible season, and he's really shown some improvement with his pocket presence, his accuracy down the field, and he's now thrown for the most yards in a two-game span in Cowboys history, which is 841 yards in two games, and he's playing at a very high level. So Dak Prescott is my offensive player of Week 11. Yeah, he was impressive. Um, to go into Detroit, uh, Detroit actually was playing pretty well up until that point. And uh, having having the success that he had on the road, uh, you know, he continues to, to, to prove that he is a quarterback of the future for the Cowboys. Um, you know, I think uh, for me, it's really having giving him the ability to spread the ball out. If he gives, if he has more chances to spread the ball around to more players and more and make more players uh, continue playmakers, um, like he did this past weekend with Randall Cobb going over a hundred yards, um, Gallup and those guys uh, continue to, to shine bright. I think that you know they definitely found have their quarterback of the future, and Jerry Jones is going to have to have a. A big, uh, big Brinks truck ready for this kid, man, in the offseason. I know. That's the talk of the town about when he's going to have to pay Dak Prescott as his price. Seemingly going higher each week considering how well he's throwing the football for the Dallas Cowboys. But let's go ahead and flip it, Jarrell, to your favorite segment, which is Defensive Player of the Week. I'll go first. Now, I know there's one player out there that obviously had a huge game. Max goodness. Crosby, man, of the Oakland oh my, Raiders. Oh my goodness. Four oh sacks goodness. terrorizing the Cincinnati Bengals offensive line. But I also want to give some credit to Ravens outside linebacker Matthew Judon. So how about another co-defensive player of the week? So I'm going Matthew Judon and Crosby. But for Judon, he deserves some special recognition after finding a new gear this week in a tough matchup against those Houston Texans. He terrorized Deshaun Watson and the Texans offense. He had seven tackles, two sacks, three tackles for loss, and four quarterback hits. Yeah, he played phenomenal. Matthew Judon was my uh, defensive player of the week uh, as well. I think when you look at this Texas team, this Texans team, and everything that uh, that they had going for them into the game, um, for the Ravens to to essentially beat up on them, I like how they did the Miami Dolphins earlier in the year in Week One. I think that it's just uh, we have to start believing in and what the Ravens are bringing to the table. And we have to start believing in Matthew Judon, man, because he continues to to, to shine. Um, you know, having the seven tackles and the two the two sacks and um, one forced fumble, I think it's just, it, it continues to to show that uh, Baltimore breeds um, defense alignment. They breed in uh, inside and outside linebackers, and that culture there is never going to change. And it's just phenomenal to see them uh, continue success after all the household names uh, from that defense has moved on. Um, i.e. Terrell Suggs, Ray Lewis, Ed Reed, uh, you know, you can go all the way back to Loi Nada, Chris McAllister, those guys. They continue to find ways to get the best out of their defensive players. And uh, Matthew Judon out of Grand Valley State, man, small school, continues to, uh, to showcase his, uh, his talents. Let's go ahead and go to the under-the-radar player of Week 11, Jarrell. I like this segment a lot, so why don't you go ahead and go first here? Uh, well, me, well, me personally, uh, the under radar the player is, uh, is, is Frank Clark. I think for me and what he did uh, last night against the Chargers, uh, spoke volume. Um, the Chargers always continue, continue to compete with the Chiefs and they always find ways to score and, and, and Phillip Rivers always finds ways to put up numbers. But when you have opportunity, um, you uh, the Chargers are playing, the Chargers play well when they're away from home and, and they continue uh, to play well, I, I I don't know what is what is what it is about um, not playing at that that LA stadium that gets them um, riled up and to perform the best. But um, they find ways. Um, those powder blue jerseys that look so sweet on TV, man. And uh, he went in there and destroyed them, man. And have an opportunity to hit Phillip Rivers, get the ball out, creating creating turnovers and creating opportunities for a team that lost three kill uh, last night. Um, you know, you always have uh, you always have worries with Mahomes and his health and and if he's going to be able to sustain throughout the rest of the year. And, and the, the question marks with that defense and and what they were able to do, man, they they answered them last night. And it was exciting to see a valuable performance from him and a big time win for those Kansas City Chiefs as they look to remain ahead of those Raiders who continue to surge. But for me, under the radar player, it's got to be 49ers running back Jeff Wilson, Jr., 
He had the game-winning score for the 49ers on Sunday against the Cardinals, and he was the most unlikely source to win that game for San Francisco considering the stable of backs that Kyle Shanahan uses there in San Francisco. But Jimmy G, he quickly unloaded a floating pass over the middle, and Jeff Wilson just so happened to be in the game, catches the pass. It was cover zero defense from Arizona and Vance Joseph, which left the middle of the field wide open, Jarrell. And so Wilson cruised in for the game-winning score. It was a 25-yard catch. He went undrafted out of North Texas in 2018. And in fact, he was inactive last week. And he didn't even make the initial 53-man roster considering Breida, Tevin Coleman, Raheem Mostert. But he was promoted back to the active roster due to Tevin Coleman's sprained ankle earlier this season. But these are the type of stories that I like to see, man. And a guy for him to get in the game, have such a big-time play, I think that's always something special. Yeah, I mean, that's the that's the beauty about the NFL. Um, you really never know when your, your number is going to be called. I mean, they, my rookie year, I had a guy starting in front of me. Obviously, you know, being a high draft pick, you you're you're destined to play at some point in time. But uh, going into our first game against San Francisco, I was already I was listed at the, the in the sub package, so I was only going to be in on third down. And uh, my one of my closest friends, uh, C.J. Wilson, man, at the time was was starting in our base defense. He goes down with an ankle injury the second play of the game, and from that point on, I'm starting at the at the right side defensive end. And so you have you have to take advantage of all opportunities when they come, man, and and to, to, to come up big in a game like that, um, knowing, knowing everything that's at stake, you're going against a division, uh, a division rival. And uh, the Arizona Cardinals continue to get better offensively. And so, um, you know, you, 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 uh, you continue to, to improve your team's continuity, uh, to, to fight through tough battles when you, when you have guys that are not the uh, obvious hero be coming up big for your team. I love seeing these undrafted players get these opportunities in big moments. So a lot of hard work, blood, sweat, and tears that are put in for all those guys in the NFL. You know it more than most of us as you are an active player in that league, Jarrell. But let's go ahead and move to a fact fiction segment. And we're going to go ahead and take on one of the most controversial topics, which has been surfaced all over the media, especially this past weekend. It's Colin Kaepernick and that scheduled workout and how there was blunders in uh, both sides coming and unable to see eye to eye, which then prompted Colin Kaepernick to relocate his workout to a high school in Georgia. So here's a statement, and we'll discuss whether it's fact fiction, and we'll each give our sides of the story. Here it is. Free agent quarterback Colin Kaepernick handled his workout the right way and deserves another NFL opportunity. Okay, so I'm going to have to split that up a little bit. Um, I think he definitely deserves another opportunity in the NFL solely based off a of skill set solely based off of what he brings to the table for a team and uh, how and his proven track record as far as uh, having a chance to win games. On that note, as far as handling the interview itself, I think it was handled in a poorly uh, type of, I think it was handled in a poor way. Uh, from what I've, from what I, from what the understanding that I have, uh, when he decided to move the venue towards to another, another facility, um, I've read that he's the, the security team in which was in place at the Falcons facility. He had already had his own security team set up, detailed and ready to go interviewing staff, interviewing all the media to go through um, security um, at a different high school over an hour away. Um, I live in Georgia. I know how far Flowery Branch is from Riverdale, from the Riverdale uh, high school in which he was uh, in which he moved to. So I know the inconvenience and the traffic that guys that guys have to battle each and each and every day um, in order to make that type of drive. I feel like if you're going to stick it to the man and you're going to try to, to have an opportunity to stick it to the man, me personally, I'm going to get through the interview first. I give them no reason to not sign me. I give them no reason. I mean, I mean, I give them I give them no reason to not sign me. I give them every reason to welcome me back into the NFL and the organization. This is a brotherhood. Like it's not it's not something that you just come and go. It's not like uh, you're you know, what I'm saying like you're on Wall Street and you see a guy 
And all of a sudden, uh, you know, he gets fired, he gets relieved of duties and, and, you know, you don't see him for a while. Like the NFL, we stick with each other for a lifetime. And so when you're going up there and we all go through the same interview process, they I think that the NFL was wrong in how they tried to bring about the workout. I think coming down from the head office, if you're going to try to wipe your hands clean of this whole entire deal, I think you do it in a way that is uh that is beneficial to both parties. You ask them what they like and what, and, and, and what re, and, um, in respect to what it is that they're trying to accomplish as far as Colin Kaepernick's people. And then you lay down your guidelines and their guidelines. I feel that by sending him what they send him as far as the waiver to where they, they're not liable for anything. Yeah. You deal with those things when you, when you sign on for a workout, you're, you're not guaranteed to receive treatment. You're not guaranteed to receive compensation if you get hurt or anything of that nature. But I'm saying as far as if you want to get back into the NFL, you want to prove how great of a player and great of a quarterback you are, you get signed first. You go through a situation where you compete, you get signed, you let your skill set speak for itself. And if you're doing other other uh, advocate type of uh or deals where you're literally trying to help out others, then you do that in a way that you've continued to do off the field. But like I said, like after, like after watching the whole ordeal, um, I have to side with guys like Stephen A. You wear the, the Kunta Kente shirt. That's a slap in the face. When you're sitting there in front of cameras and you're telling 32 owners that are multi-billionaires to stop being scared and to pull the trigger on a guy that if I'm paying you this money, that is a bit like that is not even one percent of the money that I get in or one percent of the money that I'm making as an as an NFL owner. I don't have to pay attention to that. My product goes on whether you're here or whether you're not. And I think Colin Kaepernick, as far as the standpoint of trying to pin them into a corner, saying I've been ready for three years, stop being scared, pull the trigger. Anybody that's tested in that regard is going to look at you and laugh, especially when they have all the all when they're holding all the pieces like Kaepernick doesn't have leverage moving forward with the NFL. You have to gain leverage on your side. If you get signed and you're performing, then you have the leverage to sit there and say, hey, uh, you know, stop being scared. Put money where where you said you were going to put money into these these programs and these organizations. And and and, you know, as far as uh, police brutality and equality in the in the NFL. But when you don't have a job and you're sitting there and your application is is what they can what they can visually see from you. You don't, you don't uh, you, you, you really it's not a great idea to go in and, and threaten and to uh, and to talk down to the guy that you're trying to get a job from. Um, I know the NFL is not fair. I know that they've done a lot of things in which I've questioned uh, wholeheartedly. But I think in this perspective, um, in this perspective about the, the 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 event and the workout, man, get through the workout, man. Show them, show those guys that you're elite. Hell, uh, at the time, man, uh, Atlanta looks awful. I mean, you could be in there impressing them. They could want to bring you in as a as a backup quarterback. Matt Ryan's job isn't solidified. Like at the end of the day, he's not a he's not a he's not in the position to boast because they've looked off over the last few years. Get yourself in there. Let all 32 teams see you. If I'm a scout flying down, I'm not going to want to drive another hour and a half after flying all the way down or flying across the country from where I've seen. Like I think that part was handled horribly. Yeah, you know. It's interesting because I really do feel like this whole setup from the NFL side, it was tainted. I think they were trying to come down on Colin Kaepernick to say, hey, you know what, we're going to give you a workout. And and Kaepernick's camp was saying, well, why does it have to be on a Saturday? Because Saturdays are obviously travel days for a lot of GMs as teams are going to play road games. And nonetheless, apparently, according to multiple reports, 25 scouts representing 25 teams showed up there to Flowery Branch to see Colin Kaepernick's workout. But after that fall through with the whole legal liability and the waiver claim, and apparently Kaepernick was saying that the NFL wanted him to sign a waiver that, in other words, where it was going to wipe out any further lawsuits from Kaepernick's side to the NFL, and Kaepernick was like, well, I'm not going to sign that because I see where this loophole is headed, and so that's eventually what led him to say, forget this workout here, I'm going to move it to high school. Another point, Jarrell, that 
led to the moved workout was that the NFL was not going to allow Colin Kaepernick's team to record the workout. And so Kaepernick, as he said, wanted full transparency. He wanted the public to be able to see the video, the workout. And the NFL is like, nope, we're going to have our cameras. We'll send the tape to all the teams after the workout. And so there is all kinds of issues already from the jump. And I could see Colin Kaepernick's side of things because he clearly sees this as a setup from the NFL. But I would have to agree with you, Jarrell. I mean, look, the guy has an opportunity. He's 33 years old. He's been out of the league for three years. He continually says he's ready to play in the NFL. And you know what? There's a lot of teams right now that could use Colin Kaepernick, and he could be their starter for great measure. But it's just a shame that there continues to be this ongoing circus from really Colin Kaepernick's team, and they're trying to dictate the narrative, it seems like, in every situation. And while I can understand their frustration, he needed to just say, all right, I'm going to take this workout. I'll sign this waiver. In fact, because they already settled, I believe, for multi-million dollars earlier, him and Eric Reed, and his buddy Reed is already in the NFL with the Panthers and was extended, mind you, by the Panthers. So Colin Kaepernick, I feel like, needed to understand the importance of first getting his foot back in the door, setting the right tone, and if the NFL really was trying to squash Kaepernick and just say, you know what, we're done with him, we already gave him his workout, then fine. But Kaepernick really could have made a case for him with those 25 scouts there at Flowery Branch with the recording sent to all the teams. And of course, that hour drive, I think only eight teams were represented because nobody was going to make that hour trip. So a lot of people and NFL personnel went back to the airport and flew out. So that was a big time inconvenience. So I'm kind of on the fence when it comes to how Colin Kaepernick handled this workout situation. It certainly could have been better with less drama if you would have just taken what was offered to him and then worked up from there. Yeah, man, I think don't wear the Kunta Kinte shirt. Like, even if you're trying to represent something, you have to move in a way that's beneficial. Small, Everything is a small, like, everything has to be calculated, small step. The NFL tries their best to not skip any steps when it comes to doing things that's going to benefit them. If it's going to benefit the NFL, the NFL has probably calculated it out tenfold. They they have people in office that calculate every situation possible that's going to go through all the ups and downs that you need in order for their product to be successful. So when you bring this to the table, trust and believe there's four or five representatives that are around Roger Goodell. Like, Hey, I think the time is now that we need to do this, this and that we can go ahead and we can go ahead and put things to rest, such and such, such and such, such and such. Like, I just, I understand that cap is for the people. I understand that cap is for uh, equality and all of those things. But in order to do those things, Cap had the Cap, Cap had the platform of the NFL in order that made that transition a lot easier to where you could step out in front of people and deliver this message and all of these things of that nature. You had the platform of the NFL. When that thing, when that is gone, Kaepernick's Kaepernick's name was was around for uh, quite some time, but then it started to falter. It started to literally slowly but surely fall off. Now we bring it back up. And the response is is still the same as it was years ago, and you're expecting different results. That's insanity. It's not going to work if you continue to approach the NFL like they owe you something because they don't owe you a thing. They don't owe you a damn thing. And at the end of the day, that $10 million, $15 million settlement that they gave you and this and that, like they make that on T-shirts. Like They make that on, on concessions. Like They're not about to sit there and – and, and, and feel bad uh, for a guy that they don't feel is given an equal opportunity when their product is still the best sport known to man worldwide. They're not going to feel any type of way about that whatsoever. Like Copper, Colin Kaepernick, even with the success that he had, didn't alter or change the NFL one bit. And at the end of the day, like a lot of ca- a lot of cats are coming in wanting to com- um, run and pass of that, you know, what I'm saying of the sorts and their skill sets outweigh Colin Kaepernick. Like I heard Eric Reed saying something like Lamar, like Colin Kaepernick was Lamar Jackson before Lamar Jackson. 
there is no way. I've played against <laughs> I, I've played against Colin Kaepernick. I played against Colin Kaepernick several times. I've actually seen I've actually seen Lamar Jackson in person competing. They are not the same player. They are not nowhere near close. Their explosiveness, the ability to get in and out of cuts to make their defenders miss, is completely different than Colin Kaepernick running around the edge and using his speed and a stiff arm to get to elude uh, would be tacklers. Like it's different. Um, and, and his pocket presence is a lot different than, than, than Colin Kaepernick. Colin Kaepernick had one of the best offensive lines in the league when he was in San Francisco. I went against them. They were mammoths. They, they literally were, 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 uh, were guys that literally would, uh, <laughs> would run you into the ground. And, and especially with Frank Gore back there at the time, like, like, man, what Lamar Jackson is doing is completely different than what Colin Kaepernick is doing. And I think when it comes to this whole ordeal, Colin Kaepernick has to see things for what it is, man. They're not going to let you back into this fraternity unless you're humbled in a sense. They want to they want to feel like they have the leg up in order to get you back in the NFL. And I understand that you don't want to bow down and you don't want to feel like you're taking a loss. But in order to gain, sometimes you have to lose sometimes. And in order to keep fighting the good fight, you have to be able to, to know when it's time to, to, to take your wins and losses. This fight that he's fighting can be – it could be uh, – I think it could reach greater heights had he allowed himself to be humbled to get signed first. And then you can start doing – like start connecting with people in that way that you've done before. But right now, man, I think that he blew his shot, man, with the way that he's talked to these owners – I'm just I'm just telling you I'm just telling you as it is as being an African American male, like you're not you can't talk to no no prestigious uh, or 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 a guy that has billions of dollars in his pocket you can't talk to a rich white man like that they're not gonna respond in that type of way like maybe around the way you can threaten people like okay the ball's in your court but when you're dealing with people who literally who literally juggle hundreds of millions of dollars every single day that you're like you're literally like an ant to them in their world and that's and that's just how it is when it comes to the to the owners and and Colin Kaepernick it's sad but that's just that's just the the off uh, the awful truth great insight there from Jarrell right there for those of you listening NFL defense tackle so Jarrell very familiar with that but a couple of points before we move on here Jarrell a lot of people forget that Colin Kaepernick by the way opted out of his contract with the 49ers three years ago so he wasn't forced out and he also declined a two-year contract worth $30 million from the Denver Broncos, which was a trade that was supposed to be facilitated by the Broncos and the Niners, but Kaepernick didn't believe he was getting paid to his worth. So a lot of Colin Kaepernick supporters quickly forget that he had plenty of opportunities to stay in the league. And so in a sense, some of this was brought upon himself, controlling the narrative, Colin Kaepernick, he needed to take some loss to gain, and it just seems like he is not willing to go there, and it is really just funneled out of control, unfortunately. I don't think his chances improved of getting back in the NFL with the way this whole workout fiasco unfolded. He just needs to uh, come to his senses and realize that there was some things he did wrong, and in order for him to get another chance, he's going to have to accept that and probably publicly apologize to the owners he called out. Yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, there's going to have to be some humble pie involved. Like, I'm with you, Cap, but the way that, they, that that you handle things and the way that your corner is allowing you to handle things is going to derail you. Some of the people that are, are in his corner giving him the 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 ability, yeah, he's a man, he's going to speak, but every every successful man has advisors. Nobody is is of any success doing things completely on their own. So there's somebody in his corner that's telling him that it's okay to continue to speak in this manner. If it's me, I'm like, hey man, we gotta pay, we gotta, we 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 probably need to tone it down with the little things, keep things as bland as you can, and to try to get your name, to try to get yourself back out there. If Kaepernick was to get signed with a team, man, and he appeared back in the NFL, that message in which he wanted to send. It would it would reach astronomical heights because obviously you can see that you would be able to see that between the NFL and uh, this quarterback that has a discrepancy about equality in, in, in America. You can see that either either they found a way to come together and find their differences to move together now, I mean, <clears throat> and, and push forward. 
but at, when you think about this now, man, and you continue to see him blast the NFL and the, and the and the juncture that he does, man, it just doesn't it doesn't seem that either side is wanting to reach any type of agreement. And there's going to be no agreement soon. I know. I I just know for a fact the only team out of those teams that I think would even give him an opportunity would be Philadelphia, because Philadelphia is known to give uh, players with with uh, tarnished reputations, a redemption, an opportunity of redemption, an opportunity to bring back their career. So Philadelphia would be the only team that I would think of uh, that would give him the opportunity to come back. But man, as far as every other team, man, I know for I, those owners aren't those owners aren't as as lenient. Those owners aren't as open as uh, a lot of people think, man. And they do not like losing money. And when we had Kyler Kaepernick in the league, the, those owners were losing money. And they did not like that. So I'm telling you, they are not going to try to go down that road again. And that's why you've seen Colin Kaepernick be out the league for three years. For the owners, it's about money. They could care less who's who's having hardships in the league. They could care less who's having hardships around the world. But for most owners, it comes for it comes down to that almighty dollar because that's the only way that they get to sleep good at night. And that's the only way they get to keep their heads held high. So for me. Colin Kaepernick, if you would have came in in a more humble situation and then spoke your mind after receiving a job, then I would have I would have been with that. But to go out there and to and to essentially blast them in front of national TV uh, when everybody's watching and telling them not to be scared, don't be running like we'll be ready. We'll still be ready. Well, you're still going to be ready because ain't nobody about to call with the attitude that you displayed last week. Yeah, and nobody has called his camp as of today. I don't think he has generated any NFL interest up to this point, so clearly things not headed in the right direction for Colin Kaepernick. But we're going to go ahead and move on to the next fact fiction topic here, and it has to do with the game that unfolded on Sunday. A blowout, Ravens knocking off the Texans 41-7. to So here is the statement. Sunday's 41-7 blowout loss to the Ravens revealed that the Texans are in serious jeopardy of missing the playoffs entirely. I would say that's true. Uh, with the with the resurgence of the Colts and how they looked over the last few weeks, and uh, with the Texans not being able to to come up big defensively, they have some holes defensively, man. The loss of J.J. Watt is big. Whitney Merciless is out there by himself. Um, they traded uh, for Conley earlier in the year uh, as far as a defensive back from the Raiders, but they still haven't haven't looked good at all, man. Uh, that that offense obviously is is tough to is tough to defend, man, especially when you have an elite player like Lamar Jackson. But to not be able to score offensively, to not you know for Deshaun Watson to to have that type of performance that he had, to have those guys in his face like how he did all day, man. I would all the red alarm, the alarms will be going off, man, because at the end of the day, the Texans could be seeing the Texans could have been potentially seeing the Ravens in the playoffs. And with that being said, man, like with this blueprint that I have in front of me, the Ravens look like they're 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 a home run threat, man. They're, they look like they're going to run away with it. And if I'm the Texans, if I have any opportunity of seeing them again. Man, I'm telling you, my, I'm going to be on high alert because those guys, uh, they definitely came with it, and we know what they bring to the table. The Texans need to be, uh, the Texans need to be worried at this point in time. I'm going to say fact as well, and I've said it on multiple podcasts. I really believe this Texans team has been overrated, and I know they went out and they, of course, acquired Laramie Tunzel, and they've really put some emphasis in building that offensive line. And remember, they're coming off a bye week, okay? So they had multiple weeks to prepare for this Baltimore Ravens team. They were shut out in the first half, which, by the way, was the first time that Deshaun Watson had been shut out before halftime as a starting quarterback in the NFL or in college. College, and it was also the first time this season that the Ravens had shut out an opponent in the first half. But when you look at what the Ravens were able to do, they sacked Watson six times. And before that Sunday's matchup, he had just been sacked seven times in the previous five games. So you can tell that Baltimore exploited something on that Houston offensive line. And then defensively, J.J. Watt's no longer there. They traded Jadavion Clowney, you know, and uh, essentially paid part of his salary to get him out the doors. And so now they're lacking firepower in that front seven. Their secondary is banged up heavily. Bradley Roby was unable to play in Baltimore. I know Deshaun Gibson has dealt with injuries. 
And so they claim Vernon Hargraves, but, you know, he struggled there in Tampa, so I'm not exactly sure how much of an impact he's going to have. And so when you put all that in, considering Indianapolis, and I've been very high on the Colts and what they've been able to achieve with Frank Reich, and by the way, they've also dealt with a bunch of injuries as well. They finally got Jacoby Brissett back. So I do think they are in danger of missing the playoffs. And you look at their upcoming schedule. They got the Colts coming up on Thursday. And then they got to play the Patriots. The Broncos at Tennessee, which is not an easy game. At Tampa Bay, which is their 3-7. and seven, But we all know that offense is still very yeah, lethal. Yeah, that offense is crazy. And then yeah, they finish out the crazy. season, bro, with Tennessee. Again, Tennessee, they're 5-5. Five and five. But they are a sneaky good team with that defense. Ryan Tannehill starting to get in a little bit of a groove. So I think Houston and Bill O'Brien, they are in serious jeopardy of perhaps faltering in the second half of the season. Yeah, um, I think uh, they really do need to figure this out because um, I'm telling you, man, I, I don't I mean, I know, you know, uh, a lot of. You know, a lot of they, they they believe in Bill O'Brien a lot, and and you know he's been down there, he's been down there for a while now, man. I, I I'm telling you, man, with the team that he has now, um, how hot they started out, and the playmaker Deshaun Watson. I think if this team finds a way at six and four to miss the playoffs, I don't think Bill O'Brien comes back. If you look at the Texans and you take the temperature of Houston's fan base, everybody wants Bill O'Brien out the door. And let's also remember, Jarrell, that all these big-time trades that were pulled off with the Laramie Tunsil, Kenny Stills, and then going out and acquiring Carlos Hyde and all that roster turnover, it's been Bill O'Brien because they don't have a GM right now. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, they don't. So he's been, he's been the one that's running the show. And so if I'm if I'm bringing in my players and I'm calling the plays and we find we're finding ways to be on a losing end, then at the end of the day, if I'm ownership, I'm going to start to point the finger at the guy that's in charge because the guy that's in charge is essentially running the entire show. Um, I don't have a general manager blame. I, this guy causing the guys to work out. You know, we have head of, we we have a head of scouting. You know, and he he gives he gives you uh, his his uh, his advice as far as the players to bring in. But ultimately, man, when you're running the show, it's your choice as a coach to decide what players you bring in. And I think, um, you know, I think they, they improved as far as the offensive line wise with the trades of Tunstall. I just think that at the end of the day, man, they they need more. Uh, like I told you before, I, I would love to see them have a vertical threat at tight end um, to be able to help out uh, against, uh, um, you know, with Hopkins and those guys. And I just think that they have they have to find ways to continue to improve, man. Hopkins and Steels are really good on the outside, but I think they need a big vertical threat going down the middle. Yeah, and a big game coming up on Thursday. We'll go ahead and get to that when we get into the game picks. But let's go to the next topic here, Fact Fiction. And the topic has to do with the tank for Tua method. As we all know, Tua Tagovailoa, he suffered that hip injury on Saturday against Mississippi State. In fact, he underwent successful surgery yesterday afternoon in Houston. And according to reports, his prognosis is excellent. So that's always a good sign considering the type of talent that he is. So here's the statement. The Dolphins should end any tank for Tua method and reassess their draft plans following Tua's hip injury over the weekend. Uh, I would have to say this is fact, man. All year long, we've talked about how you know we've linked to a uh, Alabama to Miami to the Miami Dolphins, and um, you know we know the owner Ross and how he feels, uh, you know. And and I just think that at the end of the day, they're going to set themselves up for to to be digging themselves deeper in, in a bigger hole. I think um, right now, if I'm if I'm the head of scouting department, like yeah, we have every the makeup and everything that we want on Tua. Everybody loves him. He's that guy. If he's there for us at a later round or uh, essentially a third or fourth round pick, we're going to take him at that point in time. But when we we have to look forward because essentially we're going to have the number one to number two overall pick. And with that being said, there's a couple guys that come to mind. Obviously, Chase Young, he is a game wrecker. He is a game changer. If I have an opportunity to build around a guy that essentially is going to take down some of the most elite quarterbacks in the game, I'm going to start there first. Uh we talk everybody a lot of people want to talk about Joe Burrow at LSU and everything of that nature. Um, 
I think for me, I have to see him complete the season out. I would like if he if he has the opportunity to win all the accolades in the Heisman, I would really strongly consider uh, the Miami Dolphins to take a really good look at this guy because of what he brings to the table and how he outplayed uh, Alabama defense. Um, that essentially was up and down, but they're sent, but it's still Alabama. They still play at a very at a very high level. Um, as well as I would take a look at Cam. Miami has all the has all the room to 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 figure this thing out, man. The scouting department has to become more creative, and they have to figure out ways in order to get the right personnel in there at the most uh, cost efficient way. Obviously, through the draft, that's the best way. But you know, man, if you have an opportunity to bring in a guy like Cam Newton to build around, and you have you have those players down there, they re-sign Allen Hearns. Um, you don't necessarily know what you want to do with Parker, but I know for a fact. Uh, if you have a guy like Cam Newton, you can build around Cam Newton. You can you you coming in. You have no you have a understanding of what he does, what he brings to the table, and uh, if you have an opportunity to trade for him in the off season, I think that would be phenomenal because you can absorb you can absorb a contract that you essentially could get rid of right away. And so, if I had to bridge a gap for one more year, I would do that. And if I and I would take Tua in a in a later third uh, or fourth round pick if I had the opportunity. I'm going to say fiction to the statement. I think the Dolphins should stay with Tua. Of course, now this is if if he is indeed their top target. I mean, we really don't know that for sure. But if Tua was their guy from the get, and that's why they were looking to angle this season downward to get a high pick. And I understand that it's kind of scary because Tua's hip injury, we don't know how he's going to be able to come back, if he's going to be able to restore that same torque in his hip because that is such a pivotal part of making passes down the field. But according to the prognosis, everything is good. He's expected to resume throwing the football by spring. And right now, actually, because the Dolphins have won two games, they currently own the fourth overall pick. So the Bengals... Our number one overall, a lot of people have them taking Joe Burrow number one. And, of course, Justin Herbert's another quarterback that's being mentioned from Oregon. But I think this hip injury to Tua will allow the Dolphins to use their two highest picks of their three in the first round on, say, a Chase Young, you know, that game-wrecking defensive end. You also got Jeffrey Okuda, the corner out of Ohio State, and that guy is a phenomenal defensive presence and you know Miami wants to get another corner to pair with Xavier Howard there in Miami and then he also got some potential offensive line options with Andrew Thomas they traded Laramie Tunsil and Thomas out of Georgia the guy's a monster a stud so he could be another option with one of those top first round picks but I think they can snag Tua maybe with the third pick in the first round and here's my idea if Tua is their guy you draft him and then you bring back your boy Fitz for one more year let him build bridge the gap bro (laughs) let let Fitz Take on another year of starting. He can help mentor Tua, and then Tua can take over once he's fully healthy. He's ready to go in that system. So I would say, you know, stay on the Tua train. I'm obviously a big fan of the guy. Up to this point in the season, he's had a 71% completion rate, 2,584 yards, 31 touchdowns to just three interceptions. So I think this guy is special, and if Miami is indeed targeting Tua, stay the course because I think he's going to be something special in the NFL. Yeah, I, I, I think his game is going to translate very well. He throws a deep ball exceptionally well for me. Um, his pocket presence is very, is very, is, is, is extremely well. He knows how to get the ball out of his hands. He's a strong kid, doesn't go down easily. I think for me personally, uh, when I'm in a position like the Miami Dolphins, I'm going to, I just want to try to make use of all the assets that I do have. I know our team looks awful. And we have to have an overhaul and we have to have one of the biggest overhauls um, and, and essentially kind of like NFL history. I know um, it doesn't have to be like an overhaul like the Browns. It doesn't have to be that type of overhaul when it comes to that team, because for some reason, man, the Miami Dolphins continue to compete in games. Um, they just find ways to lose uh, as of late. And so. When I look at Miami, I, it would be phenomenal to bring back Fitz because he's he's just a great mentor, man, great person, great leader, and great teammate. Uh, but if I'm looking to to have some type of impact next year in my division, um, I you, I mean, at the end of the day, you don't know how how long Tom Brady's going to play. You don't know how how time is going to play out. 
And so uh, this division is going to become up for grabs. I don't necessarily see Josh Allen taking over, taking over the division as quarterback. I don't see Sam Darnold taking over the division as well. So, I mean, if I if I'm Miami, man, I'm really trying to to crack down on how I can make use of as many uh, draft picks as possible, how I can make use of free agency. Like I said, like I said before, with Cam Newton coming up on an expired contract, if Carolina is willing to let him go for a later for a later draft pick and uh, maybe another player uh, at, at that point in time, I will absorb that $19 million for one year. If I have Tua, if I can get Tua in the third or fourth round um, to be sitting on the bench for me and resting up uh, for another year, because I know uh, wherever Cam Newton goes in the off season, I don't necessarily know if the, if the Panthers want to bring him back. We know how the owner came out and said that he's not going to continue to deal with mediocrity. Well, Cam is 0-8, so we don't know how that's going to go. But, if they have an opportunity to bring in Cam to Miami and uh, on a late round pick, and you have an opportunity to draft Tua um, in the second or third round, I would go with that. Hopefully, of course, speedy recovery to Tua. Never like to see a player, any player of that matter, go down with any type of injury. So prayers up for him and his rehab process. But we're going to go ahead and touch on one more controversial topic before we get into our game picks really quick. And it has to do with something that happened last Thursday. That has also been plastered all over social media on every sports talk show and it has to do with the brawl between miles garrett and mason rudolph brown steelers bitter afc north rivalry and of course when i saw it live i cannot believe what i was seeing but let's go ahead and get into this statement and we'll each give our side and we'll get to the game picks but the NFL got it right with their discipline following last Thursday's brawl between the Browns and Steelers. So, Jarrell, I'm curious to see your take with you coming from the league. Uh, see, this is uh, one thing I had to deal with. Um, I don't think that they did a necessarily a good job with, with Miles Garrett. I think you have to assess the person, the character. You have to assess if this is a, 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 a recurrence of a player. Or is it just a player literally losing his mind at, at, a, at a point in time of the game? I think um, when you look at the play overall, you see what Mason Rudolph is doing down there. You know at the end of the day, quarterbacks are always going to be protected no matter what situation it is. Um, so you have a guy knowing that he's going to constantly be protected, having an opportunity to uh, i.e. Put his, put his foot in his grind or try to, uh, to rip off his helmet. He tried to essentially rip off his helmet first. And when you look at Miles Garrett, just a bigger, bigger, stronger human being, picked that man up with one hand off the ground by his helmet. And it just was so funny. That it was, was funny crazy. to watch, man. Uh, to see the strength of, of of Miles Garrett in that moment while having another man on uh, uh while having another man restrain him. I think I thought it was I thought it was crazy. But I think um I think Mason Rudolph definitely deserves punishment. I don't think a fine is justified. I think uh, I think suspension without pay uh, for our game is, is definitely justified because uh, Miles Garrett doesn't lose his mind without, you know, putting you out without you putting your foot in his private parts. We don't necessarily I don't have um, audio. So only the NFL knows what was said at that point in time under the pile and between those guys. Uh, NFL films does a great job at recording all that type of stuff. But um, I just we don't necessarily know what was said. We know that the actions in which we saw through the camera lens uh, led to. Miles Garrett seeming to be uh, insane at that point in time. But I think Mason Rudolph definitely deserves at least a one or two game suspension. I think Pouncey doesn't necessarily deserve a three game suspension because he was coming to the aid of his quarterback. When you look at Mark Marquis, when you look at Pouncey on the field, you can see that he was downfield looking at the play go on. He turns around to witness his quarterback being struck in the head by a helmet. And eventually I'm going to go and protect my player. It doesn't matter who it is on the field. It doesn't matter what position you play. If you take your helmet off and you strike one of my players with it, at that point in time now, it's not about uh, it's not about the Steelers versus the Browns. It's about man versus man. It's about you and me. It's about you are trying to hurt about hurt someone um, that I essentially care about that I compete with um, on a daily basis. And so I don't think that the three game, I don't think they were married for the three game situation that they gave them. Uh, the three game suspension, I mean, but I, I think that uh, a one or two game suspension would have been just I know Larry, uh, he got his one game suspension. I thought I thought I thought that was just man. And me and Larry are really cool, man. I, I even had the opportunity to talk with him after the game. And I said, man, that is one of the most boneheaded plays I've ever seen you make just because he's a young guy. He's been playing well up until this point. 
the eyes are always on the quarterback and, um, you know, for his back to be essentially turned and you come by and push him down. And, um, you know, at that point in time, I just thought that that was a little bit of a cheap shot. I don't necessarily agree with that one. And Larry knows how I feel um, because he's a dear friend of mine. He uh, I think he was very uh, apologetic about what he did. And um, and I think he'll learn from that moving forward in his career. But it's essentially Miles Garrett and those guys. Miles doesn't need to – Miles Garrett, I would I would give him 10 games uh, the rest of this year and the start of next year. But I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't give him I wouldn't have did the, the indefinitely uh, like this like the NFL laid down. Yeah, so looking at the punishments, Miles Garrett, I have no issue in fact for me with the indefinite suspension. Now of course a lot more goes into the story and Mason Rudolph, I agree with you. I think he should have at least gotten a game suspension without pay. A fine is not enough because yeah, he did have a hand in getting that brawl spark. He tried to snatch Miles Garrett's helmet on the ground, and that's when Garrett, you know, used that ultra strength and ripped him up with one hand, and that was a crazy scene. I think Garrett, of course, lost his control and swung and actually made contact with Mason Rudolph, and so what Miles Garrett did, I think, is not justifiable, and of course, you can never be okay with that, and Marquise Pouncey, I don't think he should have gotten a three-game suspension because, as you said, he was just protecting it. It went well beyond football at that point because when you swing a helmet at a quarterback with no helmet on, that is dangerous, man. And Miles Garrett has to be thanking God that he did not hit Mason Rudolph with the crown of that helmet because it could have been way more severe, and he could have been talking about charges man like thrown in jail for assault if something more severe would have happened to mason rudolph but at the end at the end of the day i think the nfl they're showing signs to say hey you know what we have zero tolerance for this type of action of course larry ogan joby one game suspension i mean i think that's fine considering that was a just a dumb play from him but definitely a learning experience but for pouncey i would say one game suspension max because you know what, man? He's just defending his teammate. And Miles Garrett, in fact, is going to have his appeal heard in person on Wednesday. And, you know, Jarrell, something interesting came up on Sunday, a report saying that Garrett may have a loophole for his appeal because according to the CBA, which is the Collective Bargaining Agreement, it does not allow for indefinite suspensions for on-field acts. So that's something that's in the CBA writing. And so Garrett is going to take that to James Thrash, the appeals officer who will be hearing the case on Wednesday. So who knows? There could be a reduction and he could get rid of that indefinite suspension as far as the terminology goes. But I'm also gonna I'm gonna also let you in on uh, basically the guys that are are uh, listening to the appeals. So there's two guys that essentially do the appeals in the NFL. One is James Thrash. The other one is Derek Brooks. Derek Brooks uh, essentially is a guy that um, has been in the fire. James Thrash has also been in the fire. But Derek Brooks, being on the defensive side of the ball, knows how flares and tempers kind of arise when you're in the trenches. And understanding that things happen when it comes to players and uh, players and fighting and 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 things of that nature, he's going to he's going to uphold a suspension. He's going to uphold a suspension that is a, a an egregiously dumb penalty or an egregiously dumb uh, act on a player. But understanding that temper that flares uh, arise in the in 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 play and understanding that people uh, essentially have hearts they have emotions and sometimes they they are outside of them uh, outside of themselves Derek Brooks is a little bit more inclined to uh, essentially reduce the suspension he's he's had a known track record at finding ways to reduce suspensions uh, for players after appeals just because of the simple fact that he is a more understanding person as as opposed to James Strash, who is literally strictly by the book, um, whatever that, whatever, whatever the rules say in the handbook, that is the, that is what is going to come down from James Strash. I've had appeals uh, from both of them, and I understand how they both operate. And so, under, with that, with that being said, ha- he's 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 essentially facing an uphill battle. He has things in his clause with the indefinite 
uh, with the indefinite suspension being in the CBA and how he's not allowed to, to have an indefinite suspension. But when it comes to James Thrash and how he feels about the code of conduct and the rule books and what he, when it comes to the players, I don't see this suspension uh, necessarily coming down uh, to be anything less than 10 games. Yeah, we'll see how that shapes up tomorrow. We'll have some more updates on that. I know Pouncey is going to be appealing his three-game suspension as well, and I think that has more of a likely chance to get reduced just considering the circumstances. But let's go ahead and get into our Week 12 picks, and we'll close out the show. So let's start on Thursday night, Jarrell. Colts at Texans. This is a pivotal game. AFC South, division title at stake, pivotal matchup. Who are you going to take in this one? Man, as awful as the Texans looked last week, I'm going to roll with them this week at home in Houston. The crowd's going to be rocking. Deshaun Watson at home. And the only sole reason I'm going to take them is because of the injury to Marlon Mack and him being out. Um, Marlon Mack has been phenomenal for their team this year. He's uh, – He's essentially – he's averaging over four yards a carry. Uh, he continues to improve week in and week out, and he's been giving Jacoby Brissett that calm uh, that calm type of attitude to run the offense. We know what Jacoby brings to the, to the table, but this is going to be a game where they're going to have to put the ball in the hands of Jacoby uh, Brissett, and he's going to have to make plays down the field. And I think uh, Marlon Mack gets you into a lot of third and four, third and five situations as opposed to third and eight, third and nine. And so – I want to go with the Texans in a, in, a, in a shootout, man. I think it's going to be a great game. I'm going to go with Houston 31-24. to 24. Um, I know T.Y. Hilton's going to have a phenomenal game, but I'm going to go with Houston. I'm going to go with the Colts here, 26-23. And I know you mentioned Marlon Mack. He underwent surgery on a right-hand fracture on Monday. But you're forgetting – Jonathan Williams, who stepped in after Marlon Mack went down on Sunday, who rushed for over 100 yards as well, to go along with Naheem Hines, a scat back there in Indianapolis. I think Indianapolis is going to win this game solely because that offensive line being so dominant up front. The Texans just got gashed for over 200 rush yards against the Ravens. Look for Indianapolis to get close to that mark because Houston, they cannot stop the run right now, especially without J.J. Watt. They're weak up front, so look for Indianapolis to expose that area. So I think they take a close game, 26-23 on the road. Let's go to the next matchup here, Buccaneers at Falcons. How about those Falcons starting to play like they should have been playing from week one? They're hosting Jameis and the Bucks. Who do you have winning this one? Yeah, this is, I feel like this is going to be a high-scoring game, uh, but I have I have Tampa Bay winning this one, uh, 36 to 31. Man, I think it's going to be a phenomenal game. I have no idea uh, what's going to come as far as offenses go. I don't know why uh, the Atlanta Falcons are trying to win games when they have opportunity to essentially get a high draft pick, but they keep they keep battling, man. And um, I, I have I have Tampa Bay winning this one, no, 30, uh, 36 to 31. I do believe it's going to be a high-scoring game as well, except I'm going to go with the Falcons. I think they get a third straight win, 31-27 over the Buccaneers. They're at home. The fans are a little bit more excited, although some of them are upset because they're threatening their draft ranking with all these wins. But I think the Falcons, they're firing in all cylinders. Something was said over that bye week. Dan Quinn is coaching for his life, and Atlanta seems to be responding. So give me the Falcons. 31-27. 31-27. Next game, Broncos at Bills. I have the Bills winning this one 20-13. I think the defense will be the difference for Buffalo in this one. Yeah, man. I, I, I too, have the Bills winning. Uh, the Broncos, I, they poured it all out over the last week on the road in Minnesota, man. I, I think it's just going to be too much for them coming into uh, to, to Buffalo. I, I, I know what those fans are like. It's starting to get cold. Uh, that's when the, the fire tables come out and they, they start to act crazy, man. So, I, too, have Buffalo winning, um, but I have them winning. Uh, hopefully, this sticks true, man, but I have them winning in a score of 27 to 24. Giants at Bears. I have the Bears winning in a very low-scoring game, 17 to 13. We all saw Mitchell Drabisky. They continue to look 
treacherous offensively and then there's all that controversy about why Trubisky was pulled in the final series and then Nagy comes out and says well Trubisky was dealing with the hit pointer so man a lot of mess there in Chai Town I still like them to get it done at home against the Giants who we know they're positioning for the draft at this point and that Bears defense I do think will come alive Khalil Mack he'll be licking his chops going up against Daniel Jones who by the way has lost a lot of fumbles this season. Yeah, his ball security is uh, continuing to uh, to slip and uh, be a concern for the for the New York Giants. It's tough for me to pick this game, man, just because I mean Trubisky is really not giving me much to work with. And when I sit here and I look at all the opportunities, uh, and I and I look at all the opportunities that the uh, that the that the Giants will have in this game, man, it just takes a couple plays in order to keep it rocking and rolling. And I think Daniel Jones has the opportunity to do that. On the other hand, I'm still going to roll with the Bears. I think the Bears are going to still have an opportunity to win this game, and I got them winning uh, a score to 20-10. to 10. All right, so we're both rolling with the Bears. How about the Steelers at Bengals? I have Pittsburgh bouncing back in a big way. 27-6 at this point. The Bengals, they don't have much to play for, and I like for the Steelers' defense to come out and dominate this game with uh, three turnovers by Minka, Devin Bush, and let's go with a sack. Fumble by T.J. Watt. They win big, 27-6 over Cincinnati. Man, I got them winning 30-10 to over Cincinnati. I got the Steelers, and I think that the uh, – and, I mean, the defense is going to play phenomenal, but, I mean, the Bengals in, are in it for the Joe Burrow and, and Chase Young sweet stakes, so I don't expect any much, uh, much out of them this week. Next game, Dolphins at the Browns. I like the Browns to win another game here hosting Miami, 35-17. I think they'll blow out Miami. I think the offense will continue to show signs of improvement, especially with Kareem Hunt now playing alongside Nick Chubb. Yeah, I, I too have the Browns winning this game. I have them winning in a score of 23-17. to uh, Fitz is going to come out and put up some points. You know, obviously no Miles Garrett, no Larry. Um, they're gonna try to they're gonna try to find ways to to exploit this uh, this Cleveland Browns defense. Um, so Baker Mayfield is gonna have to bring his hard hat, man. Panthers at the Saints, another NFC South matchup. I like the Saints winning this one, 24-13. Kyle Allen was a turnover machine this past week. The Saints they'll be at home. They really should have no issues taking care of business. Yeah, I, I definitely have the Saints winning this one too, um, in a score of uh, uh, twenty-eight to eighteen. I think that the Saints are going to have opportunity to just be dominant. Kyle Allen I, last week is it was atrocious, and like I said before earlier in the podcast, their owners already talked about um, the t- not being able to stand uh, mediocrity long term. So some's going to have to give if your owner's coming out and you have a big week on your shoulders. I don't necessarily think Kyle Allen responds positively. Raiders at Jets. I have the Raiders winning yet another game. How about a four-game winning streak for John Gruden? They're taking on the Jets. I like where this offense is headed. Josh Jacobs, they're getting significant contributions from that rookie class. So how about a shout-out to Mike Mayock for hitting on his first class as a GM. Raiders 26-17. Yeah, the Raiders uh, are continuing to ball, man. Um, I definitely have them. Uh, I have them winning. I have uh, Jacobs going for over 150 yards, man. Um, and I, but I think it's going to be a ground and pound game. Um, I, I have them winning 21 to 13. Uh, but like I said before, man, if the Ra- if the Raiders keep going, man, and they and they get to uh, what they get to seven and four, that game against Kansas City next week is going to be very important, man. I'm excited to see it. Lions at Redskins. I have the Lions taking it 21-17. I'm tempted to go with the Redskins. And I know Matthew Stafford, his status is still unknown. But even with Jeff Driscoll, I think Detroit has the more all-around talented team. And Matt Patricia, who's starting to get some uh, hot seat talk there in Motown, he needs a win. And if they lose to the Redskins on the road, I don't think things are going to get better. So I like the Lions to come up and get a win over Washington. Yeah, man. They're, they're, I mean, but the Lions coach has always been on a hot seat. Like, when have a, a Detroit a Detroit coach not been on a hot seat, man? True. Um, I, I expect for them to. I expect for them to beat the Redskins. I mean, Matt Patricia, their defense essentially plays uh, okay. Uh, they just have to continue to do their thing um, offensively. Jeff Driscoll has to find a way to win. 
Um, I actually think it's going to be a low-scoring game, um, 17 to 14. Seahawks at Eagles. This game was initially scheduled for prime time, but was moved up to 1 p.m. Eastern time. I have the Seahawks coming out of a bye, taking care of business in the city of brotherly love, 27 to 20. At this point, the Eagles offensively, they just have not been able to get in a rhythm. Carson Wentz is coming off a pretty poor performance, and I know he hasn't gotten help from those receivers who have dropped a lot of passes, but I like for Russell Wilson to go into Philly and to take care of business, connecting with his number one man, Tyler Lockett, who should be returning to action. Yeah, this is this is going to be uh, – it was a hard game for me to pick, man, because like I said before, Philly always responds when their back is against the wall. So this is definitely going to be a game that I feel like Philadelphia is going to get up for. So I'm going to take – I'm actually going to take Philadelphia in a win, man, but it's going to be a very tight win. It's going to be 20-17 uh, to 17 on a late field goal uh, to give Philadelphia a chance to get themselves back in contention for the NFC East. Jaguars at Titans. I have the Titans winning this one really close, 21-17 over Nick Foles and the Jags. Right now, Tennessee, they're playing very well defensively. I think that's the difference. Uh, the Titans are at home. Yeah, I'm going to take the Titans at home. Nick Foles didn't look good at all last week, and – you go up against another division opponent. Who knows? Who knows you, man? I, I, I'm going to take the the Tennessee Titans. I'm going to give them a score of uh, 20, 23 to 17. Cowboys at Patriots, 4.25 p.m. Eastern time. Now we know the Patriots, they are dominant at home. However, I'm going to let my homerism show. So let's go with the upset. <laughs> Dallas Cowboys winning this one, 27-24. Now, I understand how, how much of a clown I'll sound like on Sunday afternoon, but you know what? I'm going to go ahead and roll the dice on them Dallas Cowboys and see what happens. But 27-24, I think if they're going to win this game, Ezekiel Elliott has to do something on the ground. It's going to be tough sledding. That Patriots defensive front is no joke. However, I think Dak Prescott makes plays down the stretch. Somehow, Brett Maher knocks in a field goal to win one and snatch a victory in Foxborough. Yo, this is going to be an exciting game. We got Stephen Gilmore and we got Amari Cooper. Um, I'm sure Gilmore is going to be matched up with him the entire game. Um, and to be honest with you, man, I, I, I expect I expect Dallas to find a way to, to squeak this one out. Like I'm going to I'm going to go with Dallas um, solely on the simple fact that they have a running game that their, their offense has been a lot more consistent than the New England offense. We know what they bring to the table defensively. Um, it's it's going to be a good win. It's going to be a close win. And I just I feel like they're going to have a way to win. And I'm going to I'm going to go on a score of 24 to 21. Uh, late field goal, uh, Cowboys find a way to do it. Man, bro, I think my my uh, mission to turn you back to your roots as a Cowboy fan is working. <laughs> we're week 12. <laughs> we're week 12, bro, and I'm already sensing it in your voice, man. It's almost like you, you want to just come out and say you, you want to root for the Cowboys from here on out, and that's, so, that's fine with me, bro. I got to give you confidence solely because of the simple fact that New England needed a trick play last week to win, and they didn't go in there and dominate the way that I expected them to dominate against Philadelphia. So with that being said, I do give Dallas a chance to go in there and compete against New England, but it's very tough to win in Gillette Stadium, man. I'm just trying to tell you now, it's very tough, extremely. We'll see. That's going to be an exciting game. We'll see how that shapes up, but two more games here. Packers at the 49ers. This is going to be another heavyweight battle, Sunday Night Football. I've been heavy on the Niners all season. I think they beat Aaron Rodgers and your Packers 30-27, to and I think it's going to be a fantastic finish. Yeah, I, I personally think that we're going to see some phenomenal plays by Aaron Rodgers. We're going to see some phenomenal plays by Aaron Jones. But it's, I mean, it's really essentially the front seven of 49ers that's going to uh, uh, be the, the overall uh, factor for me in this game. Their defensive line and their front seven, even without Quan Alexander being out there, their Pro Bowl linebacker, he can, they, can, they continue to keep – uh, making plays. Richard Sherman on the outside continues to keep making plays. And I, that's always been Aaron Rodgers' Achilles heel. If you have a good defensive line, if you have opportunities uh, to keep him in close, which I know that that's what they're going to do, they're going to try to keep all both tackles at, at quarterback depth of Aaron Rodgers and, do, and don't allow him to step up in the step up in the pocket. Excuse me. I'm sorry. But if they if I think that that's going to be the overall factor and 
And I, I, I think that San Francisco is going to have five to six sacks in this game. It just seems like a, that type of game. But Aaron Rodgers is going to uh, continue to make plays. But I, I have San Francisco I have San Francisco winning by 10 and a score of 30 to 20. I think that Aaron Rodgers is going to score early. Their script is going to be great. But the defensive line play overall is just unstoppable. So I just I have San Francisco winning this one just because of uh, their defensive line play. All right, the final game of Week 12 slate, Ravens at Rams. This is a Monday night game. I have the Ravens winning on the road at the Coliseum, 29-17. Part of me wants to go with the Rams because I get the sense that L.A. maybe will get on a little bit of a run here, but the Ravens have just been too dominant in the trenches, and the Rams have looked a little bit suspect defensively, and Jared Goff just has not looked like himself. Sean McVay's offense perhaps being figured out in Baltimore. That defense, they'll come after Jared Goff. They'll make him uncomfortable, which is going to force him into a couple of turnovers. So the Ravens, Lamar Jackson, they keep rolling 29-17. Uh, not so fast, man. Like, for some reason, I, I, I have the Rams figuring it out and pulling this one out. I know it's going to be a tough game. I know it's going to be a close game. But I believe in the front seven of the Los Angeles Rams. I believe in what they uh, continue to improve and do. I believe in a two-time defensive player of the year, Aaron Donald. I believe in Michael Brockers. And I think that they're going to take ownership of stopping this run and, and getting to the to the passer uh, of Lamar Jackson. And so I actually have the Rams finding, finding a way somehow to win this game um, in a score of 27 to 20. I think. Uh, the the the, Ra- the Ravens are going to try to go down and tie the game late. I expect Aaron Donald to take over at this point in time. If uh, if the Ra- if the Rams get up one score, I expect Aaron Donald to dominate. So I got Ravens. You got the Rams now. Really quick before we close out the show, I picked out one question. It was really hard. We had a bunch, but for the sake of time, I think this is a, a good question considering the circumstance we're at at this point in the season. Logan Pep Enger, I think I'm saying that right, wants mm-hmm. to know who is your offensive and defensive rookie of the year through 11 weeks of play. Oh man, oh that's um. Uh... Wow, that's tough, man. Um, I know Max Crosby is my defensive player. Uh, I mean, he continues to shine, and he's definitely uh, he's definitely my defensive player. Uh, but it's tough, man, to find an offensive player. You know, I want to I want to say Kyle I want to say Kyle Murray because he continues to keep he continues to improve week in and week out. But it's just not necessarily transferring into a lot of wins uh, for their team. Everybody was on the Gardner Minshew train at one point in time. And uh, that was a that was a, a, a great thing to see. Um, I'm kind of up in the air as far as an offensive offensive player of the year at this point in time now. But defensive player of the year for me it has to be Max Crosby. All right, for me, I got uh, Josh Jacobs, offensive rookie of the year, fourth in the league in rushing, 923 yards. He's become the 12th player in NFL history to gain at least 900 yards to his first 10 career games. He leads all rookie running backs and defensive rookie of the year for me. I got to give it to the man nobody's talking about, and he's dominating Jaguars outside linebacker Josh Allen, who Allen tied a Jacksonville Jaguars rookie record in only 10 games. On Sunday, he had his eighth sack of the season, matching the most by a Jaguars player in their rookie campaign. 27 tackles, two forced fumbles. In his first year in the league, the seventh overall pick out of Kentucky. So Josh Allen has been dominant. So I, I'd say for sure he's my defensive rookie of the year right now. Of course, we can't forget about what Nick Bosa is doing for the 49ers. He's had quite the impact as well. So a lot of young talent, Jarrell, in the league. I appreciate you again, man, joining to chat on several topics. We had a lot of information on today's podcast, a lot of controversial topics of discussion. So I certainly enjoyed it and looking forward to watching some more good football this coming weekend. Absolutely, Isaac. I'm so excited, man. Like I said, bro, we're getting down to the nitty gritty. This is where you start to see guys' phenomenal play really start to take over the MVPs, the defensive player of the years, and the offensive player of the years. Um, like I said, so this weekend uh, with Aaron Rodgers versus that defense, I'm expecting a phenomenal game. And uh, just like we did last week, man. And I just, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm excited, man. And, and thank you again for always continuing to to having me on the show continue to keep talking things up bro and uh fans we appreciate your support week in and week out oh yes sir again thanks for all the listeners out there if you're new we appreciate it we'll be back here next week so take care drill and god bless man thank you again